This is a, both a sad and joyous occasion. It's uh, sad because uh, we are this semester saying goodbye to a, 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 a long-standing colleague and friend, uh, a man who's uh, been formative for the school and for the and to the university. Uh, we have a custom when uh, our faculty decide to retire that we celebrate which is the, the joyous part. We celebrate their career, we celebrate their contributions, and it is our great joy today to celebrate Thomas Gordon Smith and his legacy. Uh, I'd like to uh, indulge you in a, with a personal note at the beginning, because uh, how, that's how I, I, I knew Thomas from, from my first coming to, you know, to, to South Bend in 1990. Uh, uh, to interview for a teaching job. And uh, I grew up in Indiana, I grew up in West Lafayette at Purdue, uh, but I never expected to come back to Indiana. And uh, I thought I would be very happy in New York City and, and, and uh, in the New York area. But uh, I, I arrived in the fall and I remember meeting Thomas, uh, or TGS as we were fondly going to refer to him from then on. <laughs> Uh, and he was at once a gentle and elegant figure with an amazing demeanor of goodwill that was astonishingly disarming. And uh, after the first five minutes of meeting him, he kind of had me. So <laughs> <laughs> New York or no New York, I was headed to South Bend. And uh, uh, it was also clear that uh, he was the right person. Uh, to change the thinking at the, at, at the School of Architecture, and that his role in changing that thinking would have far-reaching uh, effects in the education of the architect here and more broadly. Uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, where there was tr still a true dialogue uh, in architecture, great publications like Progressive Architecture, Architectural Design in London, some of you will remember those with fondness and a tear in your eye, but there were not a lot of places for young architects who were interested in classicism to train. Uh, there was Alan Greenberg in New Haven, which is where many of us uh, learned uh, the trade, as it were. John Bateau in Philadelphia, where many of, other, other of us here on the faculty learned the trade. And the uh, Institute for the Study of Classical Architecture was just an idea still being hatched in New Haven by Don Ratner. Now it's called the ICAA, and it has uh, just a plethora of, of local and regional chapters all over the country. It has become a true force in classical architecture. And while Classic America was still hoisting the banner heroically, it still didn't quite have a mainstream following. And Thomas actually was an autodidact. I mean, he learned the, 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 the beauty of classicism, his commitment to classicism on his own, and he managed to capture the support of his teachers through uh, at once using the canonical uh, aspects of, co of columns and, and their order, the, the rest of the stuff that makes classical architecture, but juxtaposed on free plan compositions. And that duality uh, gave him a, a real uh, uh, authority in the, within the mainstream to actually pursue his real love uh, which was the classical aspiration. He received his Bachelor of Arts in Painting uh, at the University of California at Berkeley and then also continued to get his professional degree, a Master's of Architecture at the same place in 1975. Uh, in 1979, he won the Rome Prize the, uh, at the American Academy. He was a fellow for the year. And uh, this is uh, like many others, uh, Michael Graves and so many other architects, he, he found his commitment to classicism and his love for uh, the, the Renaissance and the Baroque in Rome. Uh, his year in Rome culminated in the exhibition uh, of the Strada Novissima at the, Vien at the Venice Biennale in 1980. So as we, I... <laughs> From his return to the States in, the, in, in 1980, he started this practice in, in, in California, the Richmond House being one of those emblematic buildings that sort of helped change uh, people's point of view about how you use classical elements in modern and, con and contemporary uh, uh, practice. And uh, 
the next few decades were actually spent uh, ex expanding on this theory, expanding his practice, and, and then beginning to teach in, 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 in various places, which I'll, I'll get to. Uh, among his books, I think we all know, Classical Architecture, Rule and Invention, uh, published in 1987. Uh, Richard John's monograph uh, on Thomas Gordon Smith and the revival of classical architecture was published by Papadakis Press in 2001. And there were other books, but I'm just uh, ending on Vitruvius and Architecture, which is published by Monacelli. You know, three seminal publications that have helped students uh, with, with their course of study, and also practitioners. So after teaching stints at Yale and the University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, in 1989, Thomas uh, was hired by Provost Tim O'Mara and the then Dean of Engineering, Tony Michel, who I'm glad to see is in our audience. <laughs> Uh, the university had wanted a very uh, a new a new direction in in the course of uh, the architecture school, and uh, Thomas brought with him this uh, a passion and a love for classicism. Uh, I think uh, uh, Dean Michel and Provost Amara saw a great potential in that, and they could they actually visualized how the school could actually transition to yet another iteration of itself of already a long history. Thomas had inherited a school with a long legacy of great architects. I would begin with Eugenio Regneri, who, in case you don't know, was our first graduate in 1904. And uh, Regneri went on to his native Havana, along with the architect Barocas, to design the Capitol building in Havana. So we have uh, great ties to, to Cuba through that, and, and also in subsequent uh, uh, appearance as well. Of course, there's John Bergay, who's also in our audience today, and another uh, exemplary graduate of our program, <laughs> and, uh, and of course, many others. But Thomas also inherited uh, a, a largely clean slate. He, the, administra the university administration gave him a, a, a lot of uh, leeway to hire people that he thought could change the program. And uh, in 1990, he, he brought Dennis Dorden and Duncan Stroik and sent Tom Reykjavich to Rome. That was your exile. <laughs> and the following year, he brought Samir Yunus, also exiled to Rome, Nadia Ahasani, and yours truly. The next wave brought Richard Economakis and others who have, some, who have since returned to practice, and yet others still who teach at other institutions, thus spreading the... Uh, the word and the gospel. Uh, Christine Frank actually is one of those who uh, came here and then is now at Colorado. So. Anyway, many of us are grateful to Thomas, not just for our careers here at Notre Dame and elsewhere, but actually for opening up a dialogue in American architectural education. And it has not been easy. Uh, the first accreditation visit went as follows. And Thomas warned us that it was not going to be easy, but we were sort of, sit, the faculty were sitting in the room with them, we were kind of probably like deers in the headlights of a Mack truck. Uh, and we were listening to the NAB uh, leader, actually a wonderful person, but Linda Saunders said, we know what's going on here and we're not going to leave any stone unturned. And of course, chills are running up and down our spines, but in fact, their suspicions uh, despite their suspicions, uh, the accreditation team uh, left completely dazzled by the program. And of course, we had two very fine graduate students, Ben Bogar and Christine Frank, that kind of uh, sweet-talked them elegantly. <laughs> no, but through very convincing, compelling arguments about the role of technology, uh, the, role, the rigor of learning a language and applying it to uh, various sets of circumstances, and also the work of our undergraduates, who stood by this time up, uh, uh, convinced all, all but the most serious doubters at the time. Okay, so the, accredit the architectural accrediting body left happy, and we got a wonderful uh, report. And then the university's accrediting board, uh, the North uh, Central Accrediting Council, uh, came and uh, looked at us, uh, kind of, <clears throat> you know, uh, <laughs> cleared our throat several times and didn't say anything, just left quietly, but the report came back a few months later. And I remember reading the final uh, two sentences or single sentence in the part about architecture. And it said, 
It remains to be seen whether the experiment in classicism will blossom into a full-blown branch or remain a quirky twig. <laughs> well, no one's laughing now. <laughs> a year later, I'm referred to our program as the Athens of the Midwest. And fast forward 25 years later, our students are getting jobs. Of course, they have been for the last 25 years as well. Uh, but in recent years, probably for the last 15 or 20, uh, we've had more firms to, uh, coming to our career fair than we had students to fill the positions in those firms. Um, even in this deep recession that we are just coming out of, uh, virtually everyone who wanted a job got a job within a few months of graduation. Now, I'll grant you the class of 2009 suffered more than any other, but when other places, leading universities, leading schools of architecture could not place their people, their students, their graduates, Notre Dame students were finding their way through the world. Uh, and in fact, uh, they're teaching all over the world, they're working all over the world in all kinds of practices. At first, people said to us, oh, they'll just go to work for the usual group of suspects, you know, all the traditional architects in the UK and in, in the East Coast and the, those few that are doing it in the West Coast. But in fact, believe it or not, Peter Eisenman has hired our students and so has Zaha Hadid. So um, since we appeal to their intellect, we don't do to our students what so many schools did to theirs. We don't force this down their throat. We, we ask them to make up their own minds. But I think it's to our students' credit and to the faculty's credit and to Thomas's credit for uh, having uh, en engaged them in such an open way through dialogue and not to just direct uh, 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 prescription. Uh, our students are also teaching at leading universities. They're starting classical programs, as we mentioned in Colorado, and teaching uh, in other, yet other places as with uh, introducing strands of classicism and tradition and urbanism. Uh, and Andrews University, not too far up from here, has actually a complete program in traditional architecture, and they're winning. Their students are winning awards that give us a little pause from time to time because, of course, their entire faculty is Notre Dame trained. So, what did you expect? <laughs> Um, our graduates have uh, gone on to uh, uh, create towns in other countries, in, in, in Guatemala, new, new, new cities which challenge the, uh, the, the notion that uh, gated communities are the way to live in Central America. Uh, we, they, they have become uh, uh, principals in some of the leading firms around the world. And uh, some of them have gone into other disciplines, into real estate or banking or law, even politics. Uh, and while there may have been just two or three offices in this country doing classical architecture in 1990, today there's probably well over 100 firms uh, in this country and probably another as many in, in, in Europe and South America and in Asia doing the same thing. <laughs> So, uh, and, and they also in the course of the last few years, the faculty here have established winning practices, award-winning practices, and have had a real influence uh, all through the example, again, of Thomas Gordon Smith. But it's not just about the metrics, which I've just outlined, because I know that's what administrators love to hear, but uh, it's also about the values of this place. And I think what has exemplified uh, being here for 25 years has been the collegiality, uh, the, 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 a, a culture of respect for not each other, not, but the world of differing opinions of, uh, and, and, of the, and of respect for the stewardship that is to come uh, by our students who will inherit this world. So for the past 25 years, uh, Notre Dame has been an oasis for collaboration, discussion, debate, and learning, unlike any other place. And while many have contributed to this enterprise, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to Thomas Gordon Smith for making the first steps in establishing a school that has had such a far-flung influence on the profession and the academy. I want to return to my personal introduction and say, you know, Thomas, I'm grateful to you for having brought me here 25 years ago. But I think I speak on everyone in this room and far beyond. We are very grateful for you for what you've done to this place. So thank you.
So, uh, as is our custom, we will begin with our colloquium. Uh, it's my pl great pleasure to introduce uh, our, our first speaker. Uh, the speakers will be then followed by a panel discussion, and then uh, please join us for reception in, in, in the gallery where we will have a, another chance to honor Thomas. Uh, our first speaker is Lothar Hasselberger, a great friend of the school over many, many years. In fact, I remember Lothar when I came uh, from as my, when I was a tenure first tenure track faculty member here in 1992. He came for a conference, and we were reminiscing last night about that conference. So, Hasselberger uh, is the Morris Russell Williams and Josephine Chidsey Williams Professor Emeritus in Roman Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania. Trained as an architectural historian, architect, and city planner at the Technical University of Munich and at Harvard University, he primarily works on the theory and practice of Greco-Roman architecture and urbanism. Several of his many seminal contributions were his discovery of ancient construction plans at the Temple of Apollo at Didyma in Turkey, as in, is on the Augustan city of Rome and the Pantheon. Uh, a, volume he initiated, a volume he initiated on the debate of the controversial Orologium at, of Augustus appeared in 2014 in a book on Hermogenes is in preparation with an advanced chapter published together with Samuel Holtzman in the Journal of Roman Archaeology of 2015. Professor Hasselberger was a fellow of the, American, of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton and at the American Academy in Berlin and he received the University of Pennsylvania's Ira Abrams Memorial Award for Distinguished Teaching. He is an elected life member of the German Archaeological Institute and serves on the external review boards of the Jahrbuch and Romanisch Mittelungen. Professor Hasselberger has been a great friend of the school over the past quarter century. It is my great pleasure to welcome back to Notre Dame Lothar Hasselberger. Welcome. Yes, I will. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, you're fine. Excellent. <laughs> and let's get the lights down. <laughs> colleagues, and, colleagues and friends, uh, dear Michael, and most importantly, uh, dear Thomas. We are here to celebrate the accomplishments of Thomas Gordon Smith, 40 years and counting, uh, dedicated to the practice and theory of architecture at one of its truly epochal uh, watersheds between modernism on the, un on the one side and the face, our face, I would say, on the other for which we still lack a generally recognized term, postmodernism, the French literary term of the 1960s, sounds somewhat dated today. A phase, however, that may be defined by recognizing the, the renewed presence of history in architecture, both formally, practically, as well as intellectually, theoretically. In my field, uh, Greco-Roman architecture, Thomas stands out through his illustrations, this being one of them on the uh, of his book title, slightly adapted for the purpose here. <laughs> uh, his, through his illustrations, or I should rather say his illustrated explanations of Vitruvius' treatise on architecture, by far, as you know, the most important source book on Greco-Roman architecture that's come down to us. Making this book accessible, this uh, Vitruvian book accessible uh, for present-day architects and students of architecture, accessible again 
uh, after a hiatus of almost a full century from about 1900 uh, onwards, is one of the colossal achievements of Thomas. He did this essentially through the medium uh, that is so close to his heart and so masterfully present in his mind and his fingertips, namely drawing. Of course, drawing in a practical sense is for architects the necessary tool to anticipate the future state of reality as built or as imagined. And no less important is drawing as a tool for the uh, for forming uh, aesthetic judgment. Uh, and if you want to read this in writing on the walls of this very school, go to the exhibition room next door. Drawing as a tool for forming aesthetic judgment. But drawing can also, and is for Thomas in particular, a tool for gaining scholarly insight in the sense that not before you spell it uh, out, uh, spell out a subject matter in images, you can analyze these images in a way that words alone cannot do it. At this point, drawing is not just lim limited to illustrating a subject matter, but it becomes a visual analysis of it, a tool of creating knowledge. Thomas' book on Vitruvius is full of such insights gained and expressed through drawing. No translator of, Vitruvi of a Vitruvian text can gain such insights. In fact, drawings often lead to a deeper, more nuanced understanding of the text that could not be achieved otherwise. It is a most powerful analytical tools and students of architecture uh, should be well aware of it. What follows is meant to illuminate this aspect from my own experience, not again, not in isolation, rather than in collaboration with a wonderfully talented uh, graduate student of mine, Samuel Holzmann. So, in a kind of dialogue. And here is the practical problem, or the theoretical problem, if you like, at least the scholarly problem. This has hampered uh, and limited our understanding of an entire phase in Greek architecture, the Hellenistic period from about the late 4th century BC to the 1st century BC. Uh, that means uh, 300, uh, three centuries or so. And this problem is connected with the name of the Hellenistic uh, architect Hermogenes of circa 200 BC. And it is anchored in a key passage of Vitruvius, third book, third chapters, paragraphs eight to nine, where Vitruvius praises Hermogenes as having accomplished something quite extraordinary with his theory of temple building through a strategy of design in which asperitas, that's the Latin term translated with asperity or harshness or whatever that terms mean, a term means, uh, uh, what asperitas creates um, uh, through... Uh, as the most marvelous and desirable effects in architecture. These are words and seem to mean something of real importance. But what is Asperitas and what is that effect that is depicted and somehow associated with light and shadow and space and spatial depth and some sort of contrasting effects created by these, uh, by these uh, design strategies with Asperitas being in the middle this uh, um, term of harshness. But just what it was remained ent entirely obscure. Read any Vitruvius edition, uh, the texts of them, uh, and you will be left uh, in, in a limbo. In a limbo to the degree that at the International Conference on Hermogenes 1988 in Berlin, one came to the conclusion that Hermogenes' achievements cannot really 
and after all, realistically have been in architecture, it must have been something perhaps in urbanism that made him so important. But then again, nothing backed up this suspicion. It was more or less uh, a, 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 an, an assumption uh, since architecture didn't seem to work out. Um, and uh, here are the parameters. The Truvian text did uh, not lead us any further in this question. And while in Hermogenes' case we have uh, the respective building by Hermogenes himself uh, in, at the Asia Minor West Coast called Magnesia, collapsed but seemingly perfectly restored on paper, even this building did not say anything about why it was so special and what this special effect of homogenism was. Uh, what follows will then be just a quick sequence of images, uh, since we talk through images and drawings and thus appropriately enough for this subject matter. Here is this place uh, at the e Asia, I'm sorry, at the Asia uh, 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 Minor West Coast, Magnesia, not too far south of Ephesus, which most of you will know anyway. Um, and that place was uh, in pretty much the same shape. That means uh, a multitude of scattered stones around the temple. Most recently, one of the pediments being rebuilt, reassembled, but otherwise, um, if not underwater, then uh, silted and grown over. And this is all we have uh, on the site. And that happened to be the case ever since the beginning of the 19th century when British explorers uh, the site and identified it as the site uh, and the building of the great Hermogenes that was uh, meant to be so important. But that was it. Uh, a, decade, uh, a generation later, a French expedition set out uh, again to explore the building uh, of that great Hermogenes. Uh, you see uh, that's the expedition uh, in which Jean-Jacques Clergé uh, participated in 1842, drew a wonderful watercolor, a pedimental uh, side of the temple fallen flat on the ground, and created a very nice watercolor um, of only the flank of the temple because they were neither sure about the plan of the temple nor about about uh, the facade of it, so he just drew a few flank intercolonations, and that was it. In fact, it was not even published, uh, other than presented uh, in grand scale water uh, colors at a salon. Uh, and um, that was the situation for quite a while until shortly after 1900. Uh, the um, emerging archaeology in the United uh, Germany of the 18th century made a grand scale uh, excavation through the Russian museums and excavated the temple for the first time full, uh, uh, in full force. Uh, the publication of, I'm sorry, of 1904, Magnesia uh, on the Meander, is exemplary and the basis for that temple to the present day. You let me, you get a little vignette at the uh, title, uh, close to the title page of that publication. And otherwise you get um, the, the most sophisticated and state of the art rendering of architectural realities of that time uh, in plain line drawn uh, elevations and for the first time the plan of that temple with a wide uh, 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 colonnade in between the exterior ring of the columns and the cellar here. This is the so-called pseudo-dipteral temple because the inner row uh, has been allegedly omitted so Vitruvius tells us to um, save money.
Uh, among other things, and also creating those marvelous effects. Um, otherwise, you will find in that publication also state-of-the-art uh, detail uh, of all the little elements of the entire temple, and this sets the uh, standard for a present day, along with photographs. Photographs are for the first time strategically uh, deployed to stand for uh, perspectival renderings, for shadow drawings, because they were just considered not objectivity. No more it was an eye objectivity. New objects, bizarre drawings with their fabulous, spectacular, but imagined reconstructions uh, in Baroque light and shadow and perspectival depth and enlivenings. Uh, we like them so very much today again, but keep in mind this was just saying farewell to that tradition uh, of in architectural embellishment uh, in favor of a new objectivity. And the culprit for this is the German uh, uh, art historian uh, Heinrich Wörflin, who made a point that photography is now uh, uh, standing for a much more objective way of rendering uh, objects, sculptures, Gothic, classic alike, and architecture as well. You cannot do, and you should not apply shadows anymore. You should not even apply perspectival drawings. Give line drawn uh, orthogonal elevations and plans and add photographs of the specific elements, and this is it. And if you want to go further, which Germany did, is then you add to these wonderful line drawings of the temple. You can still add a, a vignette or so, this really doesn't matter, and this is the only such thing in the entire publication, a small, this small-scale vignette. Uh, in addition to the, uh, the plan, you may very well, uh, uh, also in addition to uh, the photographs of the actual elements, create a full three-dimensional uh, replica of the entire temple using, for the basis, since you can see them at close distance, the actual elements and then the uh, retrieved elements of the entablature uh, recreated here, uh, also at close view here. And the entire thing then under the best light conditions, under objective light conditions of a studio, with skylights here in the Pergamon Museum. This is the same way how the Pergamon altar is presented to the present day under objective light conditions. And uh, one column, no, it's not enough. You give a full specimen of the entablature, two columns plus the entablature under ideal light conditions. What else could you possibly ask for? And still, in the case of Hermogenes, it left us in a total limbo. Um, several ever since the 1920s, several attempts were made to at least be helpful a little bit towards, this ma towards understanding this major architect of an entire period. And Fritz, Fritz Christian, the outstanding uh, um, German uh, architect and archaeologist and draftsman of the 1930s, created a large-scale panel of visualizing ancient architecture in which this Temple of Magnesia of Hermogenes was also presented uh, together with the latest reconstruction of the altar. And you see here every single detail is perfectly rendered down to the last little joint lines back there under the ceiling, a kind of hyper-reality because you wouldn't ever see these things, but here they are in full objective perfection. And then again, what was so special about this type of temple with the inner row of columns left away and these special effects, nothing, nothing, nothing that uh, would, uh, would lead us uh, any further. In fact, in not even the drawing of Claire Shea helped us very much, but I could at least in so far um, um, bring something new a while ago. 
as I went back to the French expedition results um, and, and checked on the column height, because that's the only thing that the German publication could not um, ret uh, retrieve anymore and find uh, sufficient elements, um, saying by, uh, that the French expedition claims they have found the right column height. After all, the most important thing to uh, pre present the appearance of the temple. So I went to the school of uh, Beaux-Arts in the 1980s and found the actual evidence that Clerchy had indeed measured the drum, uh, the columns drum for drum. So the French column height is the correct one. That helped a little bit um, by simply uh, telling the uh, folks from the Berlin Museum your column height uh, reconstructed according to Vitruvius, thus uh, allegedly on safest of grounds, is too tall by about uh, more than a full meter. Uh, uh, this is how the temple has been reconstructed, and this is how we have to reconstruct it now. In my, in, my, in my inability to express light and shadow more than I could at, uh, at that time, I simply uh, 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 emphasized the intercolumnations by sheer black to emphasize their presence over emphasizing them again and showing the temple in its new column height. Okay. The entire experience was pretty frustrating uh, for me too, because the new and old French gained column height was not um, really giving us any further indications about anything marvelous that Hermogenes could have created in terms of proportions, and certainly not as for light and shadow effects. Um, as for the type of temple, just keep in mind that the Magnesia temple and the, Hermogen the Hermogenes line of temples features just the lack of that interior uh, row of columns, as we have them in these uh, magnificent Asia Minor temples such as Didyma, a whole forest of columns surrounding the cellar, but this was just not what Hermogenes did and argued for it that it looks even better and also saves you money and so forth and so forth. So um, another additional important insight, in fact, the most important insight as I see it today came from my colleague Tekla Schulz, uh, meanwhile uh, Ordinarius at the uh, University of Berlin. She analyzed a temple uh, of similar uh, plan arrangement, although of the Roman period uh, uh, in the Hellenistic tradition at Eisenoi, Asia Minor, still standing pretty well, and was the first one to, um, to show that the claim of this type of temple being more economical is just a fiction. She measured all the preserved uh, elements of the ceiling and came to the absolutely reasonable conclusion, what you save in columns, you need in the wider spans of these beams, you also need in stronger columns so that the effect is actually almost and close to neutralized. So it is a nice, inviting, but big lie that fiction that Vitruvius brings down to us, allegedly coming from Hermogenes himself, that this whole thing is not only looking better, but also less expensive. So why, why he being hesitant for a moment in doing these things? But what again was the visual effect in, in, in frankly, why was Hermogenes so famous? It was a question that kept nagging me for more than 20 years and not before Sam Holtzman came and told me, Lothar, we need to model Hermogenes in digital terms. He, Sam, is a student of archaeology, uh, but also uh, has some architectural skills, and as well as a classical, as, as well as a knowledge in classics. And he literally forced me uh, to do that seminar and uh, knowing about uh, this pretty simple things for architects uh, in the SketchUp system um, made us and worked as technical instructor to recreate the temple from scratch. And not only that, to create for the first time, imagine, uh, 
uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, or images of the temple in uh, three quarter views or all views that you want in light and shadow and thus making accessible what latest technology of around 1900 prevented us from having and thinking about how did those light and shadow effects work, especially in the colonnade. What made a pseudodiptoral colonnade so special, in fact, superior? Here you see the members of our seminar, students of, from classics, uh, architecture, art history, uh, 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 and, 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 and archaeology, just one fall seminar where we created, as I said, the temple from its basis to the, to the top, uh, the piece after piece, and started wondering what makes the pseudodipterus so special. And here are the results. They are really nothing uh, um, uh, sp uh, special. I should add that we also modeled certain things in three dimensions. In fact, we wanted to create a whole colonnade that proved to be a little bit too expensive. Inspired, we were by an uh, article of The Economist uh, at just that time. Print me a Stradivarius. You can now print a violin, a playable violin, in, in a 3D printer. So we thought we could do that with the columns and uh, we came not further than the bases as well as the ca capitals and then students could not refrain from putting me uh, in there as a imagined uh, figure. Uh, those were the kinds of things one can do these days and you can do much better, believe me, because you have the tools better than we can. But back to the question, what makes a pseudodiptoral temple now? And with a digital model, you can have so many angles and so many light conditions, summer, winter, early morning, midday, late, uh, uh, late in the afternoon, finding out what happens and what makes a open um, um, uh, the, the, the colonnade so specific over, say, a colonnade of a dipteral temple with this forest of columns in the inner row or a kind of Parthenon arrangement, uh, uh, sorry, this is the Parthenon arrangement with walls here, and this is the dipteral arrangement with columns here, i show you our next one. Uh, so in the middle, the Hermogenes solution. To the uh, left side, you have now the uh, uh, dipteral solution. Uh, allegedly, the center uh, uh, temple is much uh, superior to this one, as well as to a solution, say, in, in the Parthenon. And for the first time, we could sit in front of literally room-tall uh, recreations of the temple and study the light and shadow effects. Look at this. It hasn't been uh, around for a full century just because new objectivity prevented us from dealing with such volatile elements like light, light and shadow. And you architects know how the important that is. But I uh, dare to ask you, do you present that in your drawings or are you sticking to the new objectivity, line drawings, and maybe computer animations. Uh, in classical archaeology, in my field, it was simply lacking, and it prevented us from finding out what Hermogenes really meant with that one key term, asperitas, the harshness of contrasts in light and shade, the perspectival depth, the enclosure of rooms, the openness, all the things that we knew theoretically um, are uh, a theme of Hellenistic architecture in these large-scale porticos. This is uh, the, the Stoa of Attalus, of the American uh, uh, excavations in, in, in Athens, which gives you built-up examples of that very same asperitas, the light and shadow effects, this row of columns going back, the soaring perspectives. This is what Hermogenes had in mind. This is what he wanted to sell. And this is what he wanted to sell at all costs by telling you, in fact, 
it's obvious you use less columns and that means you save money by doing the better thing and it looks better and i tell you this harshness is something an effect that we know theoretically is a hallmark of hellenistic sculpture but we just couldn't get hold of it in architecture it was through drawing it was through rendering on a relatively primitive level every one of you at least here at this school can produce better drawings so in the, but even such a thing helped us, helped archaeologists. So in this respect, something seems to have been accomplished. But in a broader sense, way more needs to be done. For instance, on my instigation, digital rendering as taught at Penn Schools of Design has now been made a mandatory element in our graduate group of art and archaeology. These people need to have the basics of visual rendering in order to uh, uh, come to results that architects traditionally didn't give us. Vice versa, architects need to remain open-minded about the needs of their academic neighbor disciplines, us sitting there in art and archaeology, even history, and throwing us our hands helplessly because we do not have the right visualizations. Thomas has laid out both that path of towards visualization and he has marked that path. For this, Lieber Thomas, we are so very grateful to you. Thank you very much. say brava. <clears throat> Christine G.H. Frank is the founding director of the Center for Advanced Research in Traditional Architecture, CARTA, at the University of Colorado Denver College of Architecture and Planning. We're very pleased to have Christine here because she is one of the first and one of the best graduates of the graduate program that was founded in classical architecture when Thomas Gordon Smith came here 26 years ago. Christine um, got an early foundation in architecture uh, being unduly influenced by uh, Colonial Williamsburg and then she went to college at some college in Virginia designed by our third president. She shares with Thomas Gordon Smith a love of American architecture, American classicism, <clears throat> and has reflected that brilliantly in her work, in her drawings, in her teaching, and particularly in a Palladian house she designed along the Atlantic Ocean. She has held positions at the Prince of Wales Foundation, the ICAA, and, uh, and many other places, and has taught architecture at Georgia Tech, and we were very fortunate to have her uh, teach in our Rome program a few years ago. Please welcome Christine Frank. Like Kudis, esteemed faculty, staff, students, my fellow speakers, and most especially to my mentor, guide, and friend, Thomas Gordon Smith. Thank you for the honor of inviting me to speak on the occasion of Thomas's retirement. Given the unique nature and magnitude of Thomas's role in architectural education and the continuity of the classical tradition, 
it's particularly humbling to be asked to share a perspective on classical architectural education. From the moment I first began to learn from the great tradition of classical architecture, right here in Bond Hall, with Thomas and my sole fellow classmate, Ben Bolgar, <laughs> Through my internship years with Alan Greenberg and my work leading the Institute of Classical Architecture and Arts academic programs to the new frontier I occupy now, founding the Center for Advanced Research in Traditional Architecture at the University of Colorado. I have experienced and experimented with different ideas of education in classical architecture. <laughs> It is these various approaches to classical architectural education and the perspectives I've had as a student, practitioner, and teacher that I will reflect on today to honor Thomas's singular contributions to our discipline. So while considering these perspectives and planning my comments today, I came to think that there are perhaps broadly two different approaches being used to teach classical architecture today. One which is best characterized by Thomas's guide, Vitruvius, and which I'll call the Vitruvian position, and another, perhaps more prevalent approach, codified in books like William Ware's American Vignola, which I will call the formalist position. These two approaches, the Vitruvian and the formalist, illustrate not only different perspectives of how to teach, but also of the nature of classical architecture itself. So let me start with what I will call the Vitruvian position. And to do so, I want to describe how Thomas taught me and Ben and some of the things that I learned from Thomas. When I arrived at Notre Dame in 1992 to study with Thomas, as well as with Duncan, Samir, John, and other, others here, I really had no idea what to expect. After all, not much in my architectural education at that time had met any of my expectations. You see, I grew up in Williamsburg, Virginia, surrounded by the beauty and grace of early American English colonial and 20th century colonial revival architecture and urbanism. But instead of learning about this when I began my undergraduate architectural studies at the University of Virginia, my teachers instructed me in the deft and fine art of using X-Acto blades to cut color aid paper and glue it on Bristol board. To say that I thought this was irrelevant to the making of architecture would be a gross understatement. <laughs> I had imagined that I would be learning about making buildings in places like Williamsburg, but instead my professors wanted me to learn, I think, about abstract design principles, principles divorced from the realm of architecture. Progress towards learning this mystical art of abstraction seemed to be measured in variables that we could control, lines, shapes, from monochromatic to toned to full color compositions. If, in fact, there was actually any measure of it at all. By the time I was in my third year, <laughs> <laughs> By the time I was in my third year at Virginia, I was fed up and ready to drop out of school. And then my whole world changed. My family moved from Williamsburg, Virginia to suburban northern Virginia, and I saw for the first time the unsustainable, ugly, soul-deadening world that my chosen future profession had built for my fellow citizens. <laughs> If we were once capable of building Williamsburg, with its civil structure written clearly in its urban form, with its buildings along a fine-grained spectrum from commercial and residential to civic and sacred, built of solid materials and lasting construction, with an integrated landscape of gardens, squares, and countryside, if we were once capable of building such beauty, function, and meaning, why couldn't we build that today? Well, I thought that we could, and not only did I think we could equal or better our past, I felt we had to. Our profession owed it to the present and future to make better places. And so I set out to figure out how I could change the world around me for the better. Fortunately, of course, there were many others already working towards these goals, and in a matter of months, I discovered architects and town planners like Andreas Duani and Elizabeth Plater-Zyberg. 
My dive into classical architecture began in the city and quickly morphed from wanting to learn more about how to design better towns to wanting to learn how to design the buildings that formed those towns and the traditions out of which those buildings grew. Learning of Notre Dame's new program, I confess at the time I didn't even know that Notre Dame had a school of architecture, but I learned of this new program. I made the trip to South Bend, met Thomas, and Michael, a bit like you described, he pretty much had me at hello. I soon became Thomas's student and a student of classical architecture. I recall those first classes with Thomas, buying my first copy of Vitruvius, sitting up in the studio with Ben Bolgar in spaces now occupied by offices, and beginning to learn from the person who would become my mentor and guide. How does one actually teach a whole tradition of thought and practice? How does one consciously reconnect with a tradition that is so varied and vast? In part, Thomas did so by encouraging us to bring our lively mental energy to our designs rather than to follow a set of rules. Ben and I would sit in the studio, us in chairs, Thomas at the blackboard, where he would walk us through readings in Vitruvius, sketching out and giving form to Vitruvius's words. Youth style temples, triglyphs, metopes, and more would appear on the board as Thomas lectured and sketched. Ben and I furiously took notes and asked questions, and then Thomas set us free with Vitruvius's text to draw up our first temples. It was confusing at first. It was difficult. Conquering unknown words, learning drawings and design skills at the same time. But here I was learning about the making of architecture, not the making of abstract forms. And as we moved through our first drawing of a temple, according to Vitruvius's text, Thomas was also teaching us to stretch watercolor paper and render forms in shade and shadow. But learning from one text was not enough, so Thomas repeatedly would drag us off to some Grecian house or another, always in the middle of nowhere, uh, usually in a minivan at the crack of dawn, where we would set about measuring it. <laughs> Seeing the forms that Thomas had first taught us on that blackboard, forms from thousands of years ago, forms which we had first drawn out from words, seeing this ancient tr tradition of architecture used thousands of years later in America in wood instead of stone gave us our first understanding of the breadth and pos possibilities of this tradition. So as we learned from one author, so too did we learn from the canon of buildings and from American architectural history. We were taught not an idea of there being a right or a wrong way to design a building, but rather we were taught classical architecture as an ongoing adaptive process, much like the one we see in Thomas's house here, a blend of Vitruvian, American Grecian, and modern architecture. Thomas did not only teach us from books and buildings, he also helped us to see how the forms and ideas of classical architecture had been transmitted into furniture and fabric and the decorative arts when, for example, we were yet again dragged across the country to an exhibit and a conference on classical taste in America from 1800 to 1840. Now we were learning from Fife and L'Envier, we were learning about Clismos chairs and Grecian couches. We were seeing a different manifestation of classical ideas. All around us at Notre Dame, Thomas was creating a place where ideas and practice could flourish. While the light burned early each morning in his office in Bond Hall, as Thomas worked on his new Vitruvius book, sawdust poured out of the back of Bond Hall as Bob Brandt set up his woodwork shop and experimented with the design and building of furniture and models of American Grecian houses. When we went to Rome and traipsed all over the city with John Stamper, learning from the ancient, the Baroque, and the modern, Thomas was beginning here to acquire a new library for his students. In my two short years here studying with Thomas, I was immersed in a new world of ideas related to the practice and theory of classical architecture across the ages and in all forms. Thinking back on it now, I would say that we learned from books and buildings, from the distant history and the recent past. We learned how to think rather than what to think. We learned from furniture and fabric. 
We learned from Rome and America. We learned through imitation and invention. We learned to think of form, materials, and construction as interrelated. We learned to draw from a vast well of the classical tradition and bring it to bear on our needs in the present. This constitutes perhaps the teaching of a tradition rather than the teaching of a language. The teaching of how to think about and make architecture through architectural ideas rather than through abstraction. After graduating from Notre Dame, I was fortunate to go to work for Alan Greenberg. His writings on the connection between American democracy and classical architecture paralleled my own interests in creating a better, more rational, more appropriate American built environment, one which sprang from the same classical tradition as the political ideals of our republic. Working with Alan, I spent another two years learning from one who was broadly engaged with the classical tradition as a living tradition of architecture before going on to begin my years of work with the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art. Now, while Thomas and the faculty here had been setting up this new Athens beginning in 1989, a few young architects on the East Coast began setting up a new institute in New York with its first program running in 1992, what was then called the Institute for the Study of Classical Architecture. By the end of the summer of 1990, people like Richard Sammons, Steve Bass, and Michael Frank had returned home from studying in Oxford and Benyaya at the very first Prince of Wales' summer school in civil architecture. John Ratner and Richard Cameron had left the offices of John Blateau and settled into practice in New York. Marty Brandwine had taken a few classes drawing the orders with Alvin Holm and Classical America at the New York Academy of Design. These gentlemen, along with Anne Fairfax, Gabby Ratner, and Vicki Cameron, soon formed the Institute for the Study of Classical Architecture, and they asked themselves the same question that Thomas had asked when he established the program here. How then shall we teach classical architecture? Bearing in mind that the Institute was never intended to be a degree program, but that it was really focused on practitioners teaching practitioners how to design with the classical language, and remembering that many of those who started the Institute had been learning about the classical language of architecture in classes on the orders with Alvin Holm and others, it's perhaps not a surprise that the Institute chose as its principal guide William Ware and his book, The American Vignola, a guide to the making of classical architecture. Four, if you're a busy professional and you want to know how to design a building using the classical language, and you want to know how to put columns and arches together, well, it's all right there in that one book. Created for American architects and students, William Ware's American Vignola served as a principal textbook for many in the first half of the 20th century. So in the course of our discussion here today, I think it's interesting to refer back to William Ware's preface to understand his reasons for creating the American Vignola and the nature of architectural knowledge of the classical tradition at that time. His story is worth quoting at length here. So I'm reading from his preface, his words. In January 1859, I went from Mr. Edward Cabot's office in Boston, where I had been for two or three years, to join the little company of half a dozen young men who were studying architecture in the studio building in 10th Street under the inspiration of Mr. Richard Hunt. Mr. Hunt had just returned from Paris and was eager to impart to younger men, though we were not much his juniors, what he had learned in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and in work upon the New Louvre. We had all, I believe, had more or less of office experience, but those were the days when the Gothic revival was at its height. But, uh, and Mr. Hunt found most of us unfamiliar with classical details and quite unskilled in their use. I, at any rate, knew hardly a touch of them. And I remember well the day when I was carefully drawing out a Doric capital according to measurements given in my Vignola Mr. Hunt took the pencil out of my hand and setting aside the whole apparatus of modules and minutes, showed me how to divide the height of my capital into thirds, and those into thirds, and those again into thirds, thus getting the sixths, ninths, eighteenths, twenty-sevenths, and fifty-fourths of a diameter which the rules required without employing any larger divisor than two or three. It seemed as if this method, so handy with the Doric capital, 
might be applied to other things. And I forthwith set myself to studying the details of all the orders and to devising for my own use simple rules for drawing them out. The present work presents the results of these endeavors. After that preface, he immediately moves into the five orders. This is, it should be obvious, a very different approach than that of Vitruvius, which I will compare in more detail in a moment. But for now, let's return to the way the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art was developing to teach classical architecture. In addition to William Ware, other texts that had been key to American architects practicing in the early 20th century were adopted as teaching guides by the Institute, including uh, Harbison's study of architectural design with special reference to the program of the Beaux-Arts Institute of Design, McGoodwin's Architectural Shades and Shadows, and McGonagall's Architectural Rendering and Wash. From these early beginnings, we formed an educational program at the Institute structured around the following process of learning. First, one would learn the names and how to construct classical molding profiles. Then we taught how to put these shapes together and create a classical order. Then we taught students how to use these orders to generate architectural design. And finally, we taught them how to present these designs as analytiques, carefully shaded and shadowed and rendered in wash. This is still the structure of the Institute's teaching process. Though in recent years, Richard Cameron made efforts with the Beaux-Arts Atelier to expand beyond this formalist approach, as well as Michael Mesco and Stephen Chrisman, who are now working to expand the range of educational approaches. So if you'll recall my description of Thomas's approach to architectural education, compare that to this approach derived from the American Vignola and the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, I think you may begin to see the differences in what I'm calling the Vitruvian and the formalist approaches to classical architectural education. To further this understanding, let me now draw some comparisons and contrasts, mostly contrasts. First, on the education of the architect. We are, we are all well familiar with Vitruvius's description of what is necessary for the education of the architect. He instructs us to consider two important things. First, that the architect basically must know a little bit about a lot of things. He says, the architect should be equipped with knowledge of many branches of study and varied kinds of learning. For it is by his judgment that all work done in the other arts is put to test. Later, he expands this to tell us that the architect must know about drawing geometry, the use of the rule and compasses, how to make plans for buildings in their grounds, apply the square, the level, and the plumb bob. He tells us we must know about optics, arithmetic. Uh, we must know how to calculate costs and compute measurements. We must, must know about geometry and how to solve problems of symmetry. He tells us, too, that we need to know about history, philosophy, music, medicine, law. In fact, he says that, quote, since this study is so vast in extent, embellished and enriched as it is with many different kinds of learning. I think that men have no right to profess themselves architects hastily without having climbed from boyhood the steps of these studies and thus nursed by the knowledge of many arts and sciences, having reached the heights of the holy ground of architecture. These various bodies of knowledge, Vitruvius tells us, are the children of both practice and theory. Practice, he says, is the continuous and regular exercise of employment where manual work is done with any necessary material according to the design of a drawing. Theory, on the other hand, he continues, is the ability to demonstrate and explain the productions of dexterity on the principles of proportion. And so Vitruvius sets out for us the body of knowledge the architect requires and that we must engage with that body of knowledge through both making and thinking, through both practice and theory. Throughout the remainder of book one, Vitruvius continues through descriptions of fundamental principles of architecture, the siting of cities, the building of walls, directions of streets, and locations of public buildings. In other words, he begins with the city. He moves then in book two through the origins of architecture and characteristics and properties of different building materials. It is not until book three that he begins describing architectural forms. And after first describing symmetry and overall temple layouts, he finally moves to the forms and lines and shapes and proportions of architecture. 
For Vitruvius, it seems, the forms of architecture are connected to many other things, things such as materials and construction, as much as they are reflective of character and history and place. And it's the role of the architect to bring all of these things together through the architect's judgment. This is quite different from William Ware's approach, which includes a page and a half of an introduction beginning with the words, a building is a shelter from the rain, wind, and sun, followed by a description of the forms necessary to provide that shelter, roofs, walls, windows, and doors. In short order, he then gives us the names and definitions of architraves, friezes, and cornices, how those go together to make entablatures, and moves immediately into molding profiles and the orders. Now, it should be pointed out that these two books had different intentions. One was intended as a complete treatise, or as Vitruvius described it in his introduction, he had in his book, quote, disclosed all the principles of the art of architecture. Whereas William Ware intended to write a guide to the making of classical architecture. So their intent was different, yes, but so too was their thinking about the nature of classical architecture. <clears throat> So I'm not entirely sure that I have clearly defined this in my own mind yet, but I've been thinking about it a great deal lately as I create our new Center for Classical and Traditional Architecture at the University of Colorado. So I'd like to try to tease out this distinction for your consideration. William Ware seems more focused, if not solely focused, on the forms of classical architecture and how to make the lines and shapes of a Roman classical style. The materials and methods of which that architecture is made seem to matter little to the form. So a Dork temple could be of stone or wood, and one could, and perhaps even should, in Ware's formulation, make the stone Doric temple and the wood Doric temple look exactly the same. Vitruvius, on the other hand, says that part of the reason temples in different styles take different forms is the materials of which they're made. So the Etruscans made their friezes of wood, their architraves of wood that can span such a distance that the columns can be wide. Doric temples made of stone must have a deep architrave and narrowly spaced columns. This connection between material, structure, character, and form seems to embody and encourage this rich, adaptive quality of the classical tradition and the many variations in architectural form that we see across different places and times. So it's here in my mind, between Vitruvius and William Ware, that we have these two different approaches to classical architecture and thus to classical architectural education. The Vitruvian seems to be the deeper and more whole of the two. The formalist stops at the surface. The Vitruvian seems to be about forms grounded in reason. The formalist struggles to give reason for one form over the other. The Vitruvian seems to have greater capacity for invention and change. The formalist seems to repeat rather than adapt forms. If in education today we could take the Vitruvian approach taken here, we might see the engine of tradition hum to life again. We might see the classical tradition as a source of not only formal and compositional ideas, but of deeper processes and meanings. In the invitation to today's colloquium, Thomas is quoted as striving for a richness of meaning. I believe this Vitruvian approach to architecture and education has provided that richness of meaning to Thomas and through Thomas to all of us, his students. And so my perspective on classical architectural education is finished, or at least my perspective at this time is finished. For if there is one thing among all that I have learned from Thomas, it is always to be a student. I'd like to conclude by reminding us here in the light of Our Lady of the great accomplishment that Thomas has achieved. At a time when almost none were learning and none were teaching from and engaging with, a tradition of architecture that had created the greatest monuments and places of all of history. At a time when thousands of years of knowledge of how to build well had been jettisoned in favor of abstraction and new architectures, Thomas reached back into history and brought the classical tradition forward into our time. 
So Thomas, as your student, on behalf of all of those who have been your students, whether directly here at Notre Dame or at a distance learning from your books and articles, on behalf of all of those of us who will benefit in the future from the buildings and the places that Notre Dame alumni will create, on behalf of all of us who have benefited from your lively mental energy and judgment, thank you. It is not enough, but thank you. You have disclosed to us all of the principles of the art of architecture. <laughs> First, I would like to publicly thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here at Notre Dame. This not on? Okay. <laughs> I just said I wanted to personally thank you for giving me the opportunity to be a part of the University of Notre Dame. We met the first time in 1991, sitting in front of your house, drinking iced tea, sitting in a couple of my chairs, <laughs> if you'll remember. <laughs> And then you brought me on in uh, January of 92. So, as everyone in this room is probably aware, Thomas's uh, great passion is with furniture, the history of furniture, the design of furniture. I think it actually rivals his passion for architecture. <laughs> and uh, together, we built a furniture program here. It's something uh, that's meant a lot to me. Uh, so, I'm going to introduce our next guest, having said that. Peter Kenny. He is widely considered the nation's foremost expert on American furniture and decorative arts. After spending 30 years as the curator and administrator of the American Wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Peter stepped down in 2015 to accept the position as co-president of the Classical American Homes Preservation Trust. This trust was founded in 1993 by Richard Genret to protect, preserve, and open to the public examples of classical American residential architecture and the decorative arts of the first half of the 19th century. For the past 25 years, uh, Peter has been a frequent visitor to our campus. Through his visits, his lectures, and critiques, he has enhanced our school's curriculum and our understanding of design, benefiting both faculty and students. Peter is a highly sought after lecturer and has authored numerous award-winning articles and books, most his, including his most recent book, The Duncan Fife Master Cabinet Maker in New York. I have had the good fortune to have been a part of two collaborations with Peter and with Thomas, one being a pair of pedestals for the American wing of the, at the Met, and the other being a piece for a private collector. In both cases, I came away a better designer and a better craftsman. When you step into the world of Peter Kenny and Thomas Gordon Smith, you have to be at your best. Excellence is expected and nothing else is accepted. So having said that, I'd like us to give a nice warm welcome to Mr. Peter Kenny. Thank you for that nice introduction, and uh, thank you, thank you so much, Michael, for inviting me to celebrate Thomas's great achievements here. It's a, a pleasure and an honor, and Thomas and Marika, to the two of you, um, you're just very special people to me, and I think there's so many people here today, and I feel so honored to be able to, to participate and to add my two cents. Bob makes me sound like a rather stern taskmaster in terms of excellence, and uh, I'm only that way because I work with people like Thomas who are extraordinary. Um, I have a slightly different perspective on this. I know I was assigned to talk on the study and preservation of American classical furniture and architecture, but um, 
To be honest with you, I'm Thomas's client. <laughs> I'm his colleague and I'm his friend. And I thought today I might to spend a little time giving you a personal view of Thomas and how he interacts with somebody like me, not necessarily with the students or other faculty here. And our journey, our building, uh, exploring, building, and learning with Thomas, because in the end, as uh, I think Christine so ably said, uh, we're all, all students and we need to continue to be students and Thomas has that capacity to get us all to realize the wonder of, of life and so many things. So Thomas, uh, I hope today's adventure uh, on screen here will give you some nice memories as well. Um, building, dreaming, exploring, uh, build, explore, build, teach. Uh, uh, learning is my side of the story here. Teaching is also my side of the story. As a curator at the Metropolitan for many years, as a 501c3 educationally chartered institution, I have to say that's what it is about. It is about teaching. But we teach by osmosis in the American wing and throughout the museum. People wander to see art. They are inspired by place, they are inspired by objects, and it's a very personal experience. So some ways figuring out to get under their skin, to get them to look, to get them to see, to get them to enjoy. Uh, these are things that I think working with Thomas and our galleries has really helped. The first slide you see here is Thomas Cole's An Architect's Dream. As I said, it's a dream to work with Thomas, so I'm gonna call this a client's dream. <laughs> Thomas, uh, I have known for 25 years. It seems that's the magic number here. In 1991, I met Thomas when he came to the museum to um, work and to consult with another curator on the staff at that time. We made a fast friendship because, as um, Bob mentioned, Thomas had a passion for furniture, and I was the curator of the furniture collection. We had many long talks and, I think, period of gestation that brought us to a wonderful project we actually uh, accomplished together in the American Wing back in 2007, it was completed. It was part of a redo of the American Wing, uh, of the galleries of the American Wing. Not only was I curator there, but I was also the administrator for the American Wing, and I worked very hard on helping us to realize a new master plan that was begun and and sort of launched on September 11th, 2001. I still remember the day we had our first meeting in our courtyard with the architects, and uh, that very day, the terrible day in New York occurred, and we all said, will this ever happen? Um, the world has a way of healing, the world has a way of coming around and allowing us to do the things we need to do. The new American Wing, as it was envisioned by the team of curators in the American Wing, working with Kevin Roche, Don, John, uh, Kevin Roche of Roche Dinkel Associates, and Thomas Gordon Smith, the only other architect we brought on the entire project in consultation with uh, Kevin Roche's office. Um, I think the results were fantastic. We have had that very first year when we opened a million visitors to the American Wing. Six million to the museum, so we tilt the building this way a little and they kind of run towards, they run towards the east, the northeast, north, I'm sorry, the northeast corner of the, uh, of, of the museum. And I think one of the reasons that Thomas was engaged is we wanted to get off to the, a really great start. We had tremendous challenges in the American wing, and these were the product of, giving you a little bit of history of this, the product of, of, of so many different eras over time. It was first built in 1924. The architect was Grosvenor Atterbury. It was a way to house a collection in the Metropolitan Museum of Art that Philippe de Montebello used to like to call, oh, that cultural sort of thing they do over there. <laughs> We've had a long road trying to prove that it's art. But it is indeed, it is indeed. Um, in 1924, when it was built, one of the aspects of it that really was um, an eye-opener for people was that the decorative arts were such an important part of what we did. Actually, the paintings, American paintings at that time, were part of the interiors and part of the display in the galleries of the decorative arts. It was contextualized beautifully. <laughs> Things change, and I'll, we'll get into that in a minute. But the original plan for the American Wing was a series of floors, three floors, and gravity feed through time from the 17th century to the era of the New Republic in 1820. 1924, 1820, I think the customs agents have a definition for an antique of 100 years. Uh, anything post-1820 wasn't even considered an antique, so everything stopped at that moment in time. So in 1924, 
we went on our merry way until 1976. This is a photograph taken of the American Wing Courtyard. It was in the park. You'll notice there's a screen door on the front porch, or there's a gentleman standing there by what, with an open screen door and a rope. You could wander through the park and come right to the front door at that time. It was a different moment. But the thinking was in the bicentennial period was the time had come to expand the, the American Wing's vision in terms of time. And so as a result, uh, the money was raised to do a major project, something called the New American Wing, which opened in 1980. Uh, the Bicentennial American Wing, it was called at one point in time. And Kevin Roche, who was the museum's um, um, architect at the time, was given the task of actually expanding extensively the building. So you see on your left the 1970, 28,000 square feet to post-1980, 135,000 square feet. And one of the key features of this was to envelop what was the historic wing with a new building. Uh, there were a lot of people who wanted to take that building down, that at Grosvenor Atterbury building with the facade of uh, the Branch Bank of the United States from 1823 by Martin Thompson. But preservationists prevailed and it was preserved. But something happened, which I find happens with modern architects. I think this has been said before. Rather than integrate with it, they creeped around the perimeter. <laughs> They sort of said, well, that's your problem. It's right in the middle. We'll expand out from there. So you had, as you can see, that core, and it was wrapped. And it was very uh, wonderful to get so much extra space. But raising money and other complications caused a lot of value engineering, as they say. And as a result, in 2001, we decided we wanted to enrich these interiors and to make the 1980 building as beautiful as we could, almost as beautiful as Grosvenor Atterbury had made the original for in, in 1924. <laughs> Paintings galleries were added. The American paintings collections had been shown in another part of the museum prior to this. They were brought to the American wing. The courtyard was transformed into a 19th century uh, 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 architectural elements and American sculpture on display with a garden designed by Innocente and Babel of Roslyn, Long Island. And uh, the trees didn't last very long because the conservators said, time to have some UV protection on the glass. So the, the trees died back rather quickly, hence that, that, that image I showed you of the sculpture in the court. The rooms, again, dated from the 17th century, and now we move to Frank Lloyd Wright. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright, I have to say at the time, when I arrived at the American Wing in 1985, he was the god. This was the most important room in the, mil in the building. He continues to be the god of the building, if you have to know the truth. Everybody arrives there. But he was such a god that all the motifs and details that were taken by Kevin Roche for the decorative arts part of the, of the, um, of the galleries were keyed off of Frank Lloyd Wright. So everything from classical furniture to Rococo revival interiors, when you walked up to it, you had Kevin Roche oak detailing. And you had galleries that looked like this. Thomas probably remembers this gal gallery very well. Uh, so when we engaged Thomas to come to work with us on this, um, probably about 2003, I think it was, Thomas, uh, this is what was to be seen. And if you look back at the plan, you can see in the center, is there a laser pointer on here? No. I'm sorry. Oh, there it is. Okay. This is the courtyard. This is the old wing. This, you step out, come down a set series of steps. This is the Temple of Dendor, another entry point. You have a real crossroads here, and that was the space that I just showed you here. Very constricted, very uncomfortable, and very uh, difficult for people to really enjoy looking at American classical uh, arts of the period of about 1810 to 1840. One of the challenges that we faced was, or the face that I asked Thomas to face was, what would you do if you were asked to, as Robert Adam was asked to go into a 16th century house and to neoclassicize it? What would you do if you were to go into a Kevin Roche built, 1980 building and classicize it? <laughs> well, Thomas, in his ever, br ever brilliant mind, said, the first thing I would do is I would find a column. There's no column that you see there, but yes, indeed, there was. Thomas arrived with a drill, and we found the one column that existed, a concrete pier right here. And from that one column, we were able to live, have this living, breathing tradition of classical architecture emerge to give us, I think, an Athenaeum sort of scale 
interior space. And here's Thomas's drawing of the plan, and you can actually see the column that we had here. Everyone after that is our sats. We won't tell anybody that, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see this crossroads was transformed in a sort of a traviated Greek style into a, I think, a very successful space. This is a watercolor rendering of what we hoped it would look like. And I enjoyed very much hearing from Lotar about the idea of the drawing becoming what something, helping us to see what something could become. And you will see this momentarily. <laughs> We're on the same page, Christine. Um, as Thomas and I talked about exploring, what do we explore as a client and an architect? What do you explore with somebody who has a passion for the decorative arts as much as, as I had in this space? And the first thing you do, of course, is you have to know the past to understand the present. Two, of, two, two sort of important publications that occurred that were always on my mind as we entered into this project, and I think Thomas's as well as we talked about this, was an exhibition that was held very un kind of an unknown exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum in 1943, uh, the Greek Bible in the United States. It went from November 1943 to March 1944. Interestingly enough, Talbot Hamlin's, Hamlin's book, uh, Greek Revival Architecture in America, was published in, in 1944 as well. Uh, He's at the Avery Library. I think there's a real interconnection between Joseph Downs and Talbot Hamlin, who's there. And uh, together, this book comes out, and this wonderful exhibition is put on in the, in the Metropolitan that is photo murals of uh, Greek Revival houses from New Orleans to New England, costume, metalwork, cast iron stoves, architectural elements, ceramics, glass, uh, furniture, all the things that you'd like to see in the arts of the period. And this is a term that actually challenged my mind. I never thought of the decorative arts as the Greek revival, and thank God the term classical exists because it seems to cover all the ground. Fifty years later, in 1993, the exhibition that Christine was dragged to with Thomas and everybody here, a wonderful show at the Baltimore Museum of Art called Classical Taste in America, 50 years later revivified in color, in living color for us, what all this beautiful furniture uh, and decorative arts looked like in this period of time. It was not necessarily key to architecture, but it opened our eyes up for what possibilities could be. We began to explore. The first thing we explored was the collection of the, of the Metropolitan Museum of Art one of the great classical collections in America, as a matter of fact. So working with Thomas and looking at beautiful Cosmos chairs, like these examples from Baltimore and Philadelphia, looking at the work of Charles Andre Lanier, Duncan Fife, uh, Anthony Crevel, Joseph Barry of Philadelphia, all the greatest pieces that are iconic, that are in the books, were going to be in this beautiful gallery that Thomas and I were working on, and it gave us so much freedom. But there also would be paintings by Thomas Sully, by Thomas Cole. There would be beautiful sculpture, Horatio Greeno, 1832 portrait of George Washington. The Clinton urn, massive urns that Bob Bennett made gorgeous, gorgeous cases for that were, uh, that were uh, made in 1825 on the cel to celebrate the uh, completion of the Erie Canal. Monuments, monuments of American decorative arts, massive in scale. And on the Warwick-like vase that you see here, scenes of the falls at Little Falls on the Erie Canal. Uh, flora and fauna from America. Talk about integrating into the classical tradition something that was uniquely American. Porcelain vases from the first well-established porcelain manufa manufacturer in America, the Tucker vase, and also French goods for the American market, like this allegorical clock of George Washington. We also had cast iron and pressed glass and all the things that I think would intrigue and interest people. And they worked very hard also on the architectural setting. Um, Thomas um, has a way, I think, of making it clear to people who are decorative arts specialists like myself about the matrix from which all of this comes. And so as a result, we were searching and having fun, um, not early in the morning in the van, Christine, but uh, taxi cabs or subways there, to two, we, did, we landed on two essential sites to interpret the woodwork in the interior and some of the painted decoration and some of the details. One was the great LaGrange Terrace or Colonnade Row, uh, five of the, four of the units of the nine, original nine, still survive on Lafayette Place in New York. So Thomas, who has great experience, particularly in the blue, blue man group section over here, <laughs> uh, had been 
and continues to have a major study of this building. We poured over this interior and, uh, and really enjoyed our exercise there and understanding this building and trying to think about ornament, proportions, getting it right in the interior of, a, of, a, of an American art museum that was originally built in 1980, this section. Here's a couple views of LaGrange Terrace, and my favorite one, of course, is, uh, is this one, A.J. Davis and John Starwalt, near what LaGrange Terrace, ought, New York, ought to have been, 1833 to 34, uh, his grand vision, and his trade card from 28 to, I think, uh, 28 to 35 or something. But what I love is the term architectural composer, because, uh, the maestro was in the house with Thomas. <laughs> the second house that we chose as a, as, an, as, as a sort of a benchmark for beauty was the Alsop House on the campus of Wesleyan University, which is a beautiful cottage ornée, sort of an Italian and Greek building that had all much of its original painted decoration, as you can see, some in the frieze, trompe l'oeil elements here. On the interior, we had beautiful trompe l'oeil painting as well. And uh, Thomas brought to the party James Langley, who helped us to paint the interiors of the galleries. So we, uh, here are some studies by James for um, the type of ornament that we would do, literally um, interpreting what was in that all sub house. The ultimate result of this, of course, was the beauty of having hand-painted fresco-like paintings in the interior. And every time I look at Thomas's watercolors out here in the palette. I just think that uh, this is something that we'll have forever in the American wing as well. I have to remind people there when I left the museum, this was the most expensive fraught project ever with this painter on site, and you better protect it forever and ever as well. And some views of how Thomas opened that wretched, wretched corridor up to a beautiful balanced composition with a sort of Athenaeum scale and feel to it, utilizing the, some original pilasters from LaGrange Terrace that were the gift of Thomas and Marika to the American wing. Uh, the Blue Man Group, although they, they, they were disrespectful of the interior and they gutted it, at least Thomas was there to catch the spoil, <laughs> spolia as it came out the door. <laughs> and another view of some interlocking spaces that Thomas has opened up to make very, very beautiful spaces for the public. I go back to these galleries often now because I visit folks or use the library at the museum and I work nearby in the city. I'm always amazed at how people stop and spend time in these galleries. It used to be a passageway and now it is a destination and something that people love and enjoy. Another relationship I had with Thomas, not in a client sense that I wanted to describe for you, was something that I think helps to highlight his passion for the decorative arts, or as Bob said, his, um, well, his knowledge and his passion of the decorative arts and furniture in particular. Thomas, almost single-handedly, has helped us to understand the late work of Duncan Fife. Uh, this is a poster that I had made, a directional poster for the Duncan Fife exhibition at the Metropolitan in, in 2012 into 2013. When we did the show, I brought all the materials to Thomas Campbell, the director of the museum. You always do this. You bring the posters and the, the, some of the samples of the signage and things to show him. And I said, what do you think, Tom, of that poster? He said, oh, it's a little too austere. <laughs> which meant I should have gone back and had something made in the design department um, that was a little more jolly. And uh, <laughs> I had selective hearing at that moment in time because my goal was to celebrate Duncan Fife beyond the period that everybody knows him, to get people to really sort of embrace him in his later work. The man worked from the period of the 1790s until 1840, and we explored his whole career. But I do think the end of his career, a period of time when he worked in the Grecian plain style, a moniker that Thomas has um, put together from two sources that now carries, uh, holds forth in the field, um, uh, really helps us to sort of visualize and understand the stages of the career of this great cabinet maker. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, architecture was great, and I really did everything that Thomas told me, but I, now I said, you're traveling with me. There's a different way to do this. The first thing I taught him was to turn the furniture over. <laughs> Marika, actually he, had, he was exhausted that day, so I've had more people think it was me. I think Thomas and I were, were actually pretty much soulmates on this. But this is an example of, 
um, not just him looking with me, of you asking Thomas to be in the nicest way. He wasn't my consultant on this project at all. I did the exhibition with um, the late Michael Brown at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. But Thomas was my guide and soulmate, particularly to the later period. And he brought me especially to one site that I think, I'll go through this a little with you today and have you see it through Thomas's eyes and my eyes as we did this. And that is Milford in Pinewood, South Carolina, a great, great house um, that was built between 1839 and 1841 extraordinarily well documented from terms of how it was built, specifications, plans. I'll show you a little bit about that. But in particular, about the furnishings that were made for the house. There are a lot of questions, of course, as we think about furniture and how it relates to the house and how, you know, how intimate the architect was with the furniture makers. I think we're beginning to learn a little bit more about this. The same way there was an architectural composer in New York and A.J. Davis, there were um, decorative architects who were advertising as early as 1818. There's a show, 1808, 1808. There's a show up now at the Philadelphia Museum of Art about Benjamin Latrobe's commission for the Walm family of Philadelphia, that black and red, um, Etruscan red uh, 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 Cosmos chair I showed you before, and how one particular man, George Bridport from England, was considered and considered himself a decorative architect and worked hand in glove with Latrobe on the project. You'll see as we look at this, the amazing thing about this house is not only are there plans, but much of the original furniture survives from the house as well. Here are the owners of this house, the builders, uh, 1838 portrait and 1839, John Lawrence and Susan Hampton Manning, um, 22 years old at the time they built this. So those of you who are in this program or enter this at 22, you just wouldn't it be nice if you were having somebody else build it for you? <laughs> but a uh, handsome, handsome couple. Uh, they were in a circle of people who were connected to some of the building that was going on in Charleston at the time. The um, Greek style, sort of the, the highest Greek revival style coming out of New York City is arriving in Charleston only by the late 1830s. And it's brought there by a man named Charles Reichert who arrived in New York around 1835. He entered designs for the, um, the Hall of Corrections, the tombs that were actually um, praised for their, didn't win the first premium, but the second for their interiors and the design of the interiors in particular. He was a member of the founding, uh, the, the sort of the charter organization that led to the establishment of the American Institute of Architects in New York City and came to Charleston to design the Charleston Hotel. You can see very clearly that there's a relationship between Milford and the Charleston Hotel in terms of the of the portico on both of these uh, buildings. And I was really enjoyed seeing the slide of, of the st uh, Stoa at Atlas that Votar showed earlier. I often like to show this to sort of express to people the beauty of the shadow and the light that is sort of um, felt when you're on one of these porticos. Uh, there's something new in Charleston, Rhode in Charleston, South Carolina. The specifications for the interior are beautifully um, uh, iterated by Nathaniel F. Potter, who was the master builder of this house. He was a master brick mason. Perhaps Reichert is the conceptual composer of the building. Uh, it tells us so much about the interrelationship of architects and builders and I like to think perhaps ultimately furniture makers as well and as the same way that you've got builders and architects and furniture makers here in the training program as well. Here we have the principal floor plan. The specifications are beautifully written, five or six pages of them. You can see a gorgeous plan here, and I like to think of some of the interlocking open spaces in our gallery, Thomas, in the American wing. Uh, I been involved with other interiors at the Metropolitan, including a shingle style house by McKim, Mead and White. And everybody got real excited about interlocking interiors and sliding doors and things like that. Well, I was dumbfounded when I stood in this room in the center hall and I peeked around corners and everything was wide open anyway. So there's a beauty to this plan that perhaps informed some of that shingle style work as well, as we know through McKim, Mead and White. The plan for the colonnade is very clearly stated as six Corinthian columns styled from the monument of Lysacritus. Uh, we won't give him spelling credit there, but it's, uh, it's accurate. Uh, and the handbook that is often cited is Menard Lefebvre's Beauties of Modern Architecture. 
The bill of lading survives for a series of boxes of furniture that were sent there in 1841. John Manning, he says James is wrong here, but John Manning is in New York in 1840 on a trip and we imagine that he had went to uh, Duncan Fife's shop to talk about custom work. He also went to the galleries of a man named Count Binda to buy um, <coughs> classical marble sculpture, paintings of Roman ruins. This was a classical palace he was putting together here, and so the arts are all fully integrated in the mind of this young couple as well. The second part of the bill, I, I love little details like this where it says, you will uh, please observe that the uh, railing for the basin stands, um, I can't quite read that, need to be attached with screws, <laughs> which is great. But these basin stands have these trusses or the Grecian plain style design that was so exciting that plays throughout the house. There's a description of a truss on the staircase with a twist. But this is what Duncan Fife in his uh, cabinet uh, uh, shop referred to as a, has his Grecian scroll. And these Grecian scrolls play out beautifully in the great tradition, the same way you have the Greek revival, revival being the first American national style of architecture. This style of furniture plays out from New York to Philadelphia to Ohio. Uh, this is how you have to think about this, how it all comes together. In this particular case, very richly decorated and done in rosewood. The interiors of the house are beautiful. The Lysicritus columns repeat uh, through the interior. The sliding and folding doors are specified right out of Menard Lefebvre's book on a new design that he had developed for it. This is the ornament that's in the center. And as Lefebvre said, this is original and appropriate design for a center of flower to parlors of the first class. Well, if that's not a first class parlor, I've never seen one. <laughs> Luckily, there are photographs of the interiors, so we knew where some of the furniture was originally located in the house. Thomas and I traveled there with some of my colleagues who worked on the project with me at the museum, spent several days at um, Milford, and because Dick Jenrett was not home there and I wasn't working for him at the time, we were what would you describe us as? We were pretty bad, Thomas. We moved every piece of furniture in the house <laughs> as if they were maquettes. Yes, mobile. As if they were maquettes to sort of get a feel for what belonged here, there, and everywhere. And we had a wonderful time. This is the Madam X of Side Chairs by Duncan Fife. And it, of course, was in the parlor, and we know that. And here is one of the slab tables that was in the, in the hallway. And here is the recamie that I think, or the Grecian couch that was in the hallways that you see as well. Uh, sometimes when you're doing these projects in the dining room, you have these aha moments. And I think they come from spending time with Thomas and being so inspired and being so focused when you're with him on things. And we're traveling around the interior of the house. And I think I know furniture pretty well, and I can identify woods. But one day, we're sitting and looking at them. And suddenly, I realized the way the house was arranged, the furniture was all over the place. It was in the halls. It was in the dining room. It was in the parlor. The bedroom furniture was the basin stands were used for side tables. I started to study them the same way you would find the declension of an interior from Corinthian to Ionic to Doric. The furniture, there was a declension in the furniture as well. The rosewood furniture was all for the parlor, the most expensive. The walnut was for the hall where people came in with their dusty clothes and the dining room was all mahogany. Then it became a game of moving around and finding all of that furniture as, as it was veneered, the types of wood that were used, and that's why we moved so, so much of around the house that day. It was an inspiring time to spend with Thomas and to move my colleagues down there. And I learned. We explored and we learned. And I think came away with um, an inspiration about how furniture and interiors work together that really informed the publication and the exhibition uh, as well. And these are, are a good example of the rosewood chair on the right and the mahogany dining chair, the same form, stripped back and simplified for the dining room. This example on the right is mahogany but had been grain painted rosewood in the Fife shop to make it acceptable. The same way that skipping the interior um, perimeter of columns on the building to make it of mahogany instead of rosewood that you grain makes it a little less expensive. Thomas and Marika 
are such good friends. The last time I was here, this is my final salute to you, Thomas, um, I stayed with them and had a lovely breakfast. And before I left, uh, Thomas said, well, I have to show you something that's upstairs before you leave. And Thomas and Marie brought me upstairs and brought me to a bedroom that I had stayed in one other, one other time. And I was always intrigued because there was a giant cheval glass in that room that belonged at Milford originally that Thomas had acquired from a dealer. And I said, well, what's new up here? And he says, well, what's new is that this cheval glass is going to Milford. So he made a gift of it to Milford Plantation. And here it is now in the bedroom, which we have recently installed with one of the original French beds in the basin stand. So Thomas, your ach uh, achievements, your talents, your love of beauty are expressed in the American Wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They will always be there uh, in my lifetime and yours at least, and our children's, I hope. Milford Plantation, you put your mark there as well through your scholarly work and the beautiful gift of this object to, to us. This is a thank you to you and a tribute to you as a great scholar, a great friend, and probably the greatest architect I know. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, that was wonderful. Uh, we'll take a five minute break. Uh, we're running a little bit of uh, behind uh, schedule. Uh, so we'll take a five minute break and uh, reconvene for our last two uh, presenters and our panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you.